Hello, this is TV Bookshelf. I'm Dave Lenander with the Rivendell Group of the Mythopoeic Society, a discussion group that meets once a month to talk about fantasy and science fiction books in the Twin Cities. Today we're talking with Lois McMaster Bujold, one of the leading science fiction writers uh, in the field today. Thank you. Um, I have with me today a printout of some of the awards that she's received over the last few years since uh, 1987. And uh, it's a very long list. One of her websites, her fan websites, the fans wrote that she's received more Hugos than anyone but Heinlein. And uh, I think she's received a lot of awards he never received. <laughs> well. um, I've actually been on a committee to, uh, that, that awarded the Myth Peak Fantasy Award to uh, The Curse of Chalian yeah, um, a couple years ago. And uh, your recent book, Paladin of Souls, is uh, a finalist this year for the Myth Peak Fantasy Award as well. Yeah. Whoops. And also for uh, the Hugos. And a finalist for the Hugos, and a finalist for the, is it a, for the Locus Award? And mm, it's uh, a contender, and then there's also uh, a couple of romance awards. It's a very strange book in that it's cross genres in all directions. It's been interesting that way. You've been one of the most successful science fiction writers around, and is that partly because you have both mass fan adulation as well as uh, critical acceptance in these awards? and uh, There's different kinds of success, I guess, and uh, I, my feeling is one should try to advance on all fronts. Um, and that, you know, this is the waiter, this is the career I ordered. Uh, but certainly when I started out, uh, I was just, you know, a housewife stuck in, in a small town in Ohio with no job and, you know, wanting to make a little money. This was the original, original uh, scheme of the thing. Uh, and everything else has sort of followed slowly, but relentlessly ever since. I think it's a, a reward for persistence as much as anything else. I remember the first time I met you was at a minicon and you were standing in a corridor, people kind of walking by you, not noticing, not knowing that you were going to turn into this <laughs> powerhouse writer, I guess, and you had a, Someone a book for sale. Someone would be too shy to talk to. Ethan of yeah. Athos, and ah, I, yes. I bought it from you there. Just Very good. Yeah, that would have been uh, 1986 probably or uh, About thereabouts that. a little thereafter. Yeah, it was, it was a slow start. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm one of these, you know, sort of overnight success after 20 years people, of which there are many uh, in the literary field. Uh, by the time you come to broad public notice, you've usually been out and working for, for a rather long time, slowly building. Well, you published three books almost at once, but that's mm -hmm. because you'd been writing for a while, right? Yeah, I had uh, started out, and of course I had the usual problems that any author has for breaking in. Um, I wrote books, I sent manuscripts to New York, you know, they sat on editor's desks for months and months before being read and rejected and coming back and going out again. Uh, I started actually writing at the end of 1982, and uh, my first short story sale occurred at the end of 1984. I had sold uh, a short story to Twilight Zone magazine, uh, which is no longer extant, but, uh, but they bought my little, mm -hmm. little tale, and uh, it was very exciting, and it sort of boosted my morale. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't solve my financial problems, but uh, it carried me through the writing of the next book. And by that time, uh, my second novel, The Warrior's Apprentice, had arrived uh, on the editor's desk, desk at Bain Books, uh, which is a science fiction and fantasy specialist publisher. And uh, after a couple of months, they bought all three. So they brought them all out, uh, although it had taken three years to write them. They were all published in one year, in 1986, in uh, June, August, and December respectively, which was actually very good for me uh, as a career start because it made me very visible very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's important to have like more than one book out on the shelf uh, because there are so many competing for the reader's attention. And you received a Best First Novel Award way back in, uh, in, in 87 for Shards of Honor. I, I was well, actually a nominee, but you know, it was, it was starting even then. Uh, I was starting oh, to get sorry, attention yes. very quickly. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was a Compton Kirk nominee, so that was good. Uh, my first actual award was uh, for a novella titled The Mountains of Morning, which is also in the, in the Miles Varkoskin science fiction series. And that was, um, I think, a nebula uh, one for that. Yes, I've read that or, story. No, wait, it was Falling Free was the first one. I'm sorry, it's, it's beginning to be far long enough ago <laughs> that I'm beginning to lose track. This is disturbing. Uh, Falling Free, I think, was the first award, which was uh, Nebula. 
Well, I think in a lot of ways, um, one of the reasons you've been so successful is that series with Miles. Mm -hmm. And people just love those stories. Mm -hmm. And I talk to people all the time. Um, I asked several people, um, I asked the committee, in fact, the current committee, if, and I sent the memo last night so then people mostly didn't have a chance to respond, but I said, what questions should I ask, Wallace? <laughs> You've all freshly read Paladin of Souls. And the questions were, when is she going to write another Miles <laughs> book? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that seems to be the case. Yeah, that, uh, that may be a victim of my own success here. Miles is a, a very attractive character for, for the readers who, you know, for the viewers who don't know what we're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I have a long-running science fiction adventure series, uh, which has as its principal pro, but not only protagonist, a uh, fellow by the name of Miles Vorkuskin, who is uh, physically handicapped, but uh, very bright and uh, extremely ambitious, uh, somewhat over-revved, in fact. Uh, and he goes out and has assorted adventures in his, his galactic milieu, uh, some of which are external and some of which are internal. Uh, he has a lot of character growth and development. And people seem to enjoy that. They enjoy the continuing characters. They enjoy the kind of the soap opera aspects mm -hmm. uh, as much as the science fiction. And they enjoy the character growth uh, because character isn't static. Uh, things could happen next to him that nobody expects. Uh, so. I remember in a, <laughs> in a Rivendell group discussion of, of, I'm not even sure it was about your book, but somehow we got onto the subject of your work. And someone was saying she thought what was so wonderful about your books was the way that they seemed to be space opera, um, war fiction, and yet when you start reading them, they turn out to be these, these comedies of manners and these uh, intensely character-driven stories. And she thought that was one of the reasons that you had um, both broad appeal uh, and also intensely loyal readers, mm -hmm. people. Yeah, I have, um, Bain Books is famous for a certain flavor of packaging, uh, which is kind of a house branding. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't always match the book that's inside. Uh, so you can kind of recognize a Bain cover in any bookstore uh, because they all kind of look like Bain Books. Uh, so they are probably less a guide to the, to the content and flavor of the book than um, some of the ways books are packaged by other publishers. Um, and, and they like this sort of exciting adventure story packaging. Uh, but uh, I like exciting adventure stories too. You know, mm -hmm. if, if nothing happens through three or four chapters, I want something to like wake me up as well as the reader. Uh, but I also like the more complex character exploration. And I think that all action ultimately stems from character. It's the spring of action in all stories. Uh, so I, I want both. Basically, I'd, I, I'm a very greedy writer. I don't want to leave anything out. I want the comedy and the romance and the drama and the tragedy and the adventure and everything else I can, can get in, just like real life. Or maybe like Dickens. Yeah, perhaps, yeah. Do you, um, are you taken aback sometimes by the, the, the response from all your fans? I notice there are whole websites devoted to uh, fan fiction and artwork and filk songs. And you, you indicated on, at one point that you were kind of keeping all that at arm's length for, for obvious reasons mm -hmm. now. Um, but I, I'm impressed by one of the awards in a way that you received, this fan oh, letter yes. here. Oh, yes. This is Can my you? most interesting recent fan letter. Uh, this is a quilt that a fan made for me. Uh, handmade, gorgeous thing. Let's fold it up. Uh, and uh, it's got a letter attached to it. Uh, written here, it says, for Lois McMaster Bujold. The circles of this kaleidoscope quilt remind me of your characters. Each is complex and beautiful in itself. Some themes are shared among them, and together they make various patterns which seem more or less prominent at different times. I hope this quilt gives you some of the same pleasure and warmth your books have given me. Cassie Neff, 2004. So, I mean, this is a fan letter. Yes, you know. I'll say. Uh, a tremendous amount of handwork went into this. Yes. Thought. But... Uh, well, a tremendous amount of thought and, yeah. and handwork goes into your books, yes, too. Yes, yeah. so it's, yeah. kind of a, it's kind of a mutual thing that we have going here. And when you start building so many books, it becomes kind of a patchwork, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. The, the way the series books talk to each other is, uh, is a sort of structurally fascinating thing to me as a writer. Uh, I have defined genre uh, lately in a conversation as uh, a genre is any group of books in close conversation with one another. 
And uh, in a way, a series can be like that, uh, in that the books can uh, not just be you know, repeats of the same mm -hmm. story, but can actually comment on each other in various thematic ways, which is artistically interesting and something you can't do with one book um, in the same way. My sense is that your most recent Miles book, um, uh, The Civil Campaign? Uh, uh, actually, uh, Diplomatic Immunity. Diplomatic Excellent. Immunity. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Actually, I need to hold it up here briefly. This is a, a typical Bain cover, uh, very, uh, very much on the uh, military side, although it's not a military story. The character isn't uh, in the military anymore. He's now a diplomat, but we have a military cover nonetheless because it's a Bain book. Well, <laughs> but there, there is military aspects yes, to these, there are. Mm -hmm. these stories, and uh, so I think that's one of the reasons they, they appeal so widely. Um, but certainly, Miles, in a way, is kind of, a, kind of an inverse to Captain Kirk or a or a, or a military general in a lot of ways. Yeah, he is, he is not an anti-hero in any way, but he's kind of a counter-hero. He is all the things that the standard hero is not. He's not six feet tall and brawny and lantern-jawed and mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, doesn't instantly dominate a room, although he has found ways to do so. Uh, regardless, he's four foot nine, he has brittle bones, he has uh, physical handicaps. Um, he, a typical standard, story opening is for the young character to go out and get away from all their parents and relatives. It's kind of coming of age story is when, when the, the protagonist goes out away from home and finds himself and, and, and comes back. And these frequently start with like making the kid an orphan. Mm -hmm. So another way that Miles is uh, atypical is that he's not an orphan. He's got a very active family and relatives and, you know, and they don't ever go away. They come around and bug him. You know, so he has to deal with all these kinds of matters. Um, as, uh, as many other uh, fantasy heroes get to skip. You know? So I've kind of given him all the, all the, uh, the sort of reversals mm -hmm. of the standard hero. He's also a self-conscious hero. Um, he is, he is postmodern in that aspect, uh, in that you know, he's aware of, of the possibility of heroism. He's, he's playing to the, uh, his, you know, his audience, both inside his own head and outside. Uh, to a certain extent, uh, so he's uh, somewhat lacks humility <laughs> as well. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, he's 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 an interesting study that way as as a, a kind of inverted hero, and then turn him loose and see what he can do. The stories don't play out, even though the stories start from a lot of the same tropes. They don't play out the mm -hmm. same way. Now this was your Hugo for one of the Miles books, right? Mm -hmm. for Actually, this is uh, the Hugo for Barrier. We can hold it up. Okay. Uh, and this is actually a story about Miles's mother because nobody writes about the hero's mother. I've done so a couple of times now. Uh, this is a Hugo Award. It's awarded for uh, best novel and several other categories each year by the World Science Fiction Convention. It's voted for by the fans, uh, which gives it a nice broad voting base, which I think gives it extra validity insofar as any literary award has any validity. Um, and this was from the uh, 50th World Con. Uh, and uh, it also uh, has uh, on its base, the rocket is the same each year, but they make different bases. The mm -hmm. base this year uh, includes a uh, piece of grid of metal taken from the gantry of Launch Complex 26 at Cape Canaveral. This was the launch site of Explorer 1, the United States' first successful launch of an orbiting satellite. Explorer 1 discovered the Van Allen radiation belt, which had its own influence on science fiction. And these are all handmade, and uh, they're quite wonderful to have. But this one was particularly interesting because uh, somewhere there was a fan who had an inn at Cape Canaveral and yes. got this piece to help make up the awards. Yeah. Well, let's turn to your more recent series, mm -hmm. um, the uh, Chalian books, yes. and particularly, I suppose, the most recent Paladin of Souls. But maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about uh, research behind some of the books that you do. It's yeah. not, you can't research Chalian because it doesn't <laughs> exist. But. Well, yes and no. I have actually uh, done more research for my fantasy novels than I have for the science fiction, which seems counterintuitive because there's like all the science in science fiction. Well, I mostly use biology and uh, other things that I already know something about. But uh, it seems to me that a lot of fantasy takes the data from history and does the kind of same kind of what if games with them that science fiction do does with science. It's kind of twists things around and says, how could things have been differently? Uh, so um, 
almost all the science fiction and fantasy re writers I know are big history buffs, big history readers. Do you want to talk about Paladin and the Souls a little bit? I yes, love the, the, the fact that you took one of my favorite characters and made her the protagonist of Paladin. Yeah, this is another sort of ornery character inversion thing again. Um, I'm a very unruly writer, I'm afraid. Uh, Paladin of the Souls stars as the protagonist, the, uh, the mother of the hero and of the Curse of Chalion. And nobody does anything with the mother. I mean, mothers are supposed to shuffle off and get out of the way, you know, or die or something, uh, and, and get out of the way of the story. Uh, I got to thinking, because I am an older woman myself, that, uh, that it was time that uh, we got some of our own back. And so I gave uh, Ista, uh, the Dowager Arena of Chalion, who had had a, a very complicated past history, uh, and a very sad one, a sort of second chance at adventure in life, and sent her off on her pilgrimage and on her story. And, uh, got to explore a lot of things. In a lot of ways, I've, I've been calling it my chick book, because it explores a lot of women's issues, not just older women. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some younger women protagonists and characters in the story who play off of, of Ista. And uh, sort of their concerns become central, and kind of all the, the guy stuff, the war and the, and the fighting, is, is more peripheral to the, to the main themes of the plot, although they do interlock. Well, I know that as a reader, I found it enormously satisfying that poor Ista, who really had a raw deal in this <laughs> book, <laughs> does get some of her own back in, yes. in Paladin of Souls. Mm -hmm. And I, and I have grows, to say, yeah. some of the other characters are fascinating, too. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, I don't want to give too much away, but the, the nobleman who's, the, who's Our heist, yeah. doesn't, doesn't recognize his own state. Yes, and, yes. Uh, and it was, is it was grand fun. Um, yeah, all of, uh, all of the characters got very lively in that book. Uh, both Ista's uh, uh, list, the courier girl who becomes her handmaiden, and uh, Ferda and Foy, the two brothers who become her, her captains, uh, and uh, Arheis and Ilvan the two uh, along the way, um, all had their own parts to contribute to the story, all, had, all bounced off each other very nicely. Uh, in ways that I didn't always expect. A lot of people ask writers, or assume that writers kind of know the whole story when they sit down, and it's just like you know, giving dictation to, to sit down and write it. And it's like, it's not like that. You know, I only have the vaguest idea where I'm going when I start a story. And you know, each chapter, uh, I have to kind of stop back, think again, and it constantly mutates and changes as I write it. So it's a surprise for me where I end mm -hmm. up. Uh, and uh, a very joyful surprise sometimes because it's better than I would have imagined uh, way back in chapter one a year ago. Uh, Do you feel that you're writing about other things too besides character and story? Do you have any ideas, for example, this book is about honor and this book is about... Uh, almost all of them are about identity, I think, if you want to squeeze them down to one word. Yes, my books have themes, but I don't write a book to explicate a theme. A theme is like an emergent property. It rises out of the material. And only at the end of the book can I look back and say what the theme was. But I think it's like, uh, it's like a template. There's something in the back of my head mm -hmm. uh, that I'm judging each possible incident against. OK, this could happen, this could happen, this can happen. What's the right thing for this book? Well, it's this. How do I know? I don't know how I know, mm -hmm. but I do know. I feel it very strongly. You know, this is right. This slots in. You know, we progress. If I pick the wrong thing, the book stops. I get this sort of very useful writer's block that doesn't let me write 80 pages of the wrong story. Um, and, uh, and at the end, I arrive somewhere uh, that, is, that is a surprise and yet right. Uh, so, so there's something back there that knows. And I think that's, you can call it theme. Uh, even though you can't see it until the whole book is there. I find that um, among the books I've read uh, by you, especially the, the recent Chalian ones, there's a sense of mystery and meaning. There's a, mm -hmm. a meaning in these books that maybe I can't put in, in words directly, but which um, I was almost surprised by. I think it didn't really emerge in Chalian. I wasn't really aware of it anyway until we got about midway through the book. Mm -hmm. It may have been when the, the animals the menagerie come into play, that all of a sudden this suddenly started to become mysterious. And uh, they used to talk about sense of wonder. And, and mm -hmm. I think that's especially true of these books. Thank you. And I, 
I liked Paladin of Souls. I almost wondered at times if the gods were becoming a little too forthright about what they were <laughs> having to say. Many people have been interested, by the way, in the religion that you developed mm -hmm. for the, uh, uh, of the five gods or four mm -hmm. gods and one demon, depending, <laughs> depending on, on your point of view. Yeah, one of the things I wanted to do with uh, the Chalian books uh, was uh, take religion seriously. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of sort of D&D level fiction that uh, you know, makes of religion uh, nothing more than the Spanish Inquisition or, or a thing of opposition uh, or something mechanistic. I wanted several things from the religion in the Chalian books. I wanted the social functions of real religions to be reflected in the world that I built. Uh, because you know, the Catholic Church did all this stuff in the Middle Ages mm -hmm. that you know, we, we would now consider uh, you know, health, education, and welfare uh, services, public services. It's a way for people to organize themselves in the community uh, to do all these jobs that need done. And I wanted to uh, also hit the mystical aspects of religion, uh, which is another thing that you know, a lot of fantasy doesn't, doesn't quite hit square on. I've mm -hmm. read uh, some of the, you know, back, in, back when I was kind of reading up on religion, um, read about serious mystics uh, like uh, uh, St. John of the Cross and um, Augustine and um, uh, Thomas Merton, uh, whom I sort of got to via reading about Tolkien and, mm -hmm. and uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, speaking of mythopoetic connections. And I wanted that, uh, that kind of feel uh, for the book as well. So I wanted to get both the social and the mystic in, uh, as well as the hierarchical, which is you know, what most people get hung up on uh, when they do a medieval religion. Do you want to say something about the next book that will be coming out? Yeah, I could. It'll be a while. It'll be 2005 before this is published. But I'm presently working on the third book in the Chalian series. The title is The Hallowed Hunt. It is uh, unrelated to the two prior books uh, in terms of continuing characters. It goes to another country. Uh, with a different history, uh, different historical forces, and a whole new cast of characters. So it was very fresh for me in that regard. It's not fresh now because I'm down to the last <laughs> chapter and I've been living with these people for 18 months and it's, uh, it's time for it to be done. But it's almost finished. In another interview, Peg Kerr cited you as, as influencing her work in a, in mm -hmm. a, partly in a, in a writing group. And she also mentioned uh, Pat Reedy, as, as you did. And, mm -hmm. and I think at least one other person we talked to mentioned Pat mm -hmm. Reedy. Can you say something about how that's impacted your work, working in a group like that? Well, I have had various writers groups over time. I'm always looking for someone to bounce the story off of, to, to kind of get a, a feedback loop of excitement going for me, and to test whether the ideas are, you know, whether these ideas are going to work. Um, I'm constantly testing. I, I'm a I am one of, I'm not one of these writers who keeps the book close to their chest and doesn't show it to anyone until it's all done. I like, I like to talk to somebody about it. Um, so it's part of my process. And the, uh, the better quality feedback I get, <laughs> the better for the book. So I have sought out and stuck with people who can, uh, who can give me good critique. Pat is a superb critiquer. Uh, she's wonderful on plot logic and you know, forcing your characters to be intelligent and sensible. And, and generally, uh, generally keeping you honest, uh, so it's been a good help. Do you do you feel influenced by these other people? I mean, they obviously you're the you're the big award-winning writer who's written lots and lots of books. It's obvious how you might be influencing some of these other people. Although Pat's been going for quite a while too. Pat's not doing badly. But um, um, but what uh, what do you take from oh Peg Kerr who has two books, for instance? Do you well, see I get, any way? To uh, I get you know I get her feedback. I get uh, get her comments for excitement. As a matter of fact, she's just sent me a uh, critique on Hallowed Hunt that you know, points out, you know, you really need to explain this and you had better fix that. Uh, so I get tremendous amounts from them. I don't know what they're getting from mm -hmm. me. I think, it's, I think it's a very uneven flow. I think I'm getting far more from them than they are from me. Do you look to any other writers in the field or, or out of the field as particular inspirations? Uh, I vary. I read a lot of nonfiction because you can steal that instantly. Um, I read various books as comfort books, but I don't necessarily model on them. Um, I read a lot of Terry Pratchett, but I don't, there's no way I could write like Pratchett. He's mm -hmm. got this unique voice. Uh, so I think it's, it's a lot more oblique, uh, the way the influences run. Uh, they're there, but they're, they're not specific like that. Well, I feel like we could go on and on, uh, and unfortunately we're running out of time. So I'd like to thank you, uh, Lois McMaster-Bujold, 
for uh, talking with us today on TV Bookshelf. It's been a pleasure.